in 1974, I took my family, <clears throat> my wife and uh, my daughter and my youngest son, to Galveston, Texas. I told the church that I needed some time off. My mother had just died of cancer after being in the hospital for 50 days in spite of all of our prayers and such. My oldest son was, well, we didn't know where he was. Only God knew where he was, and the Lord wasn't talking about it. A few days before we left, my son, youngest son, added variety to the situation by breaking his leg. And he had a cast from his hip down to his toes. Uh, the x-rays showed not only the broken bone, but also some tumor-like growth on the bone and didn't have the test back yet, so I just used my imagination. And so there we were, down there soaking up sun and surf at in-season ra rates. And uh, I had the companion that I'd never had in my life before. And the best way I know to describe him is he just gloomy, shadowy, dark depression. Sort of like a shadow, you can't get rid of him. Every morning I'd wake up and there he would be standing at the foot of the bed waiting for me. And no matter what I did, I couldn't seem to shake it. And uh, so every day I was living in that shadowy depression until Thursday morning. And I woke up Thursday morning and uh, he wasn't there. I didn't see him all day. I kept looking for him. I expected him to jump out from an alley somewhere. But I didn't see him all day. Didn't see him the rest of that week. It was strange. Nothing had changed, but everything was different. I got back home a few days later. I went by the office to pick up mail that had gathered while we were away. One of the envelopes had a hotel emblem on it, a hotel envelope. But I recognized the handwriting. It was from a friend of mine who knew all about our situation and a lot more about it than what I've mentioned to you. It was written about 3 a.m. in the morning. He was at an airport hotel, and he said this morning, I've had you on my mind and my heart. And he said, I know everything that you're going through. And he said, I have this morning in prayer asked the Lord to take as much of your burden as he can and put it on me and that I may bear as much of it as I can. I wasn't surprised to find that it was dated that Thursday morning I woke up without my gloomy companion. Now that's what I call intercession. That's what I meant yesterday when I said a Christian never has to say there's nothing I can do. There's always something we can do. We can always do something great, great as Jesus did, even greater than Jesus did as we saw yesterday. And this morning I want us to talk about what it means to intercede sort of a lesson on intercession. Now I want you to open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke chapter 11. Jesus gave us two parables concerning prayer. Both of them emphasize, as I mentioned yesterday, persistence, stubbornness in it. But I want us to read Luke chapter 11. I'll read verse 1 and then skip down to verse 5 and read through verse 10. Luke chapter 11. I'll read verse 1 and then down to verse 5. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. That was a request that Jesus answered, and he gave them immediately after that what you and I call the Lord's Prayer. And then in verse 5, he gave them this story. And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, for the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, Though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, Yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. 
And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asks receives, and he that seeks finds. And to him that knocks, it shall be opened. I've always liked to think of intercessory prayer as sort of like a guided missile that you and I can fire to any spot on the face of the earth, let it travel at the speed of thought and hit its target every time, and the devil has no anti-prayer missile to destroy it. We talk a lot about evangelism, and the fact is that the lost man can evade and just about every method of evangelism there is. We can go see him and he can refuse to let us in. You can hand him a track, he can throw it away. You can call him on the phone, he can hang up. You can get on television, he can switch channels. If you do get him to come to church, he can shift into neutral and spend the hour counting how many choir members are asleep. A lost person has a great many ways of evading our, our ways to try to reach him for Christ. But there is one way that you and I have to reach that lost person that neither he nor the devil can defeat, and that is by the means of prayer. There is a means whereby I can, uh, in a very real sense, send the Lord Jesus Christ to the door of his heart and knock with conviction. I believe that the great unused instrument of evangelism in our churches is the weapon of intercessory prayer. The disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. It is significant what Jesus taught them that day. First of all, he gave them what we call, as I said, the Lord's Prayer. It's really the model prayer. I mentioned this yesterday, that the model prayer is made up of six imperatives, six requests, petitions. The first three have to do with the glory of the Father, and the second three have to do with the good of the family. But I want you to notice that this is a blueprint for prayer. I don't think the Lord necessarily meant for us to quote this prayer. That's all right to do so. I don't think that's what he actually meant. I think he's saying this is a blueprint for prayer. Every conceivable need that a man has will be met in one of those petitions. There is no need that you will ever have in your life that will not be covered by one of those petitions. And you'll notice that they are actually prayers of intercession. That's why they call it a family prayer, I guess. But he says, when you pray, say this, give us this day our daily bread. Not give me. Lead us not into temptation. Not lead not me. Deliver us from evil. Not deliver me. There is a sense in when, when one Christian prays, the whole family prays. Any prayer built on that outline, God will answer. Any prayer built according to those specifications, I believe God will answer. But it is interesting, as I said, that he makes it a prayer of intercession. Give us this day our lady bread. And as I said, that means that in a sense, every time I pray, the whole church is praying. I do not believe that you and I pray in isolation. I believe that we pray not only as individuals, but we pray as members of a family, as members of a body. Now the interesting thing about this is that you and I, as one child of God, have no right to ask something for myself that I wouldn't ask for somebody else. Do you think it'd be right? If I gave one child something and didn't give any consideration to the other child? Do you think that a parent, a father, ought to love his children equally and bless them equally according to their needs? Give us this day our daily bread. I don't have any business praying for something for myself that I wouldn't want every member of the family to have. Which sort of means that I can't pray that the Lord let me build a better church than the fellow down the street. You know, just for my own sake. It means that I can't pray, Lord, send revival to my church, but nowhere else. And I'm convinced that if God sent revival to some other church, we'd be suspicious of it. It has to come to us or we're not going to accept it. Give us this day our daily bread. What I'm trying to say is that you and I need to understand that you don't get away from intercessory prayer 
any time you pray, in any way that you pray. Intercessory prayer is not just one form of prayer. It is a special form of prayer, but in a sense all prayer is intercession because when we pray for something, even for ourselves, we're praying for the glory of God. And I want you to know something, the glory of God is always good for the family. So I don't have to be afraid or jealous of God giving you something because I know when He gives you something, it's not for your own selfish good, it's for the good of the whole family. And everything that God does, He does to benefit the whole family, not just one church, not just one preacher. I like to think of it as a triangle of intercession, and this is where we come to the parable that Jesus has given us. But I said a minute ago, it is significant that when the disciples said, Jesus, teach us to pray, he did teach them to pray, gave them this model prayer, and then gave them this tremendous story, illustration of intercessory prayer, which leads me to believe that Jesus considers this type of praying the most important and the most essential of all. Now, there are three people in this prayer, in this parable, you'll notice. There is a friend who comes at midnight. There is a friend to whom he comes. And there is a friend that the other friend goes to to get bread. So, as we look at this, I want to just point out what I consider to be maybe three or four of the primary characteristics of intercessory praying. The first would be this. Intercessory prayer is prayer that has about it a note of daring boldness, audacity. Now here is a man, and at midnight, somebody knocks at his door, and he goes to the door, and here is a friend in his journey, and he comes in, and there was an unwritten law in those days, of course, that if uh, some traveler came to your door, you were to bring him in, provide him room and board. They didn't have a holiday in on every street corner like they do now. And if you turn some away at night, it could very well mean their life. They could be killed by thieves or they could starve to death. It was just an unwritten law that when somebody knocked on your door and they sought refuge, you gave it to them. And so here is this man, and at midnight, somebody knocks on his door and the fellow comes in and uh, he's hungry, but I don't have anything to give him. I don't have any food. And uh, so he says that he goes to a friend and knocks on his door and it's at midnight asking of him to give him bread for somebody else. Now, you have to understand something. That uh, in those days, uh, they didn't have the late, late, late show and uh, everybody sat up until midnight. They all went to bed about dark 30. And uh, it was, you just didn't go calling after dark in those days. And here is a man who goes out and uh, he knocks on this friend's door and the friend answers from within and says, I cannot rise and give you. Go away. My children are with me in bed. But the man doesn't pay any attention to that. He keeps on banging away. He keeps on knocking away. He keeps on hammering and he's not going to leave until he gets what he wants. That's why I say that intercessory praying has about it a sense of daring. It has about it a sense of boldness, of audacity. You see, this man could have thought of all kinds of reasons not to go out begging bread. After all, I mean, he wasn't the one that was hungry. This traveler is hungry. Why, well, let him go begging bread. It's not, I'm not the one that's hungry. And besides, it's after midnight. I'm not about to risk friendship to go out there after midnight. I'm sure his wife added another hundred reasons why he ought not to go out at night begging bread. But the man did that. At his own inconvenience, at the only risk, at the risk of losing a good friend, he goes out begging bread, and the man from within says, Leave me alone. I like the way the Williams translates this. My children are packed about me in bed. Uh, in those days, they usually one room house, of course, and, and uh, there was sort of a bed, was, was actually just a mat, maybe, and in and, and many houses they only had one. Everybody slept together with a few farm animals uh, hanging around, too. That must have been a real blessing. Here's this man who's gone to bed, and his children not just with him in bed, they're packed around him. I mean, he had a bunch, and they were packed around him, and he's in the middle of it, and you know what happens? If he gets up, they're going to wake up every one of them. And anybody who's ever tried to get a little baby to go to sleep, have you ever noticed that? You rock and you rock and you feed, and by the time they go to sleep, the phone rings. Or the doorbell rings. I used to lay down with mine. It's easier to get them to go to sleep. I laid down, but then I had to get up. 
And any motion of the bed just woke them up and I'd start all over again. I tell you what, if I had my baby there and I had a dozen babies packed around me in bed and somebody started banging on the door, I'd shoot that fellow. <laughs> he said, I'm not about to give up. Get up and give you. My children are packed about me in bed. I, I, I'm not going to do it. I can't do it. Well, now, what's he going to do? Well, I'll tell you what I'd do, folks. I'd, I'd say, excuse me, I'm sorry. I really am. I apologize. He didn't do that. He kept on knocking. Just kept on banging. Lights in the neighbor houses came on. Won't know what was going on. Dogs started barking. He just kept on banging. And notice what Jesus said. Jesus said, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend. Now, two Greek words translated friend. One means friend and the other means to love as a brother. And that's the one that's used here. This was no casual acquaintance. This was no casual friend. He said, though he loves him like a brother, he's not going to get up and give him what he needs. Yet because of his importunity, because of his stubbornness, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. Intercessory prayer is daring, bold praying that's not afraid to lay siege to the throne of God. I remember one night... <clears throat> When I was pastor, I went down to the church on Saturday night. I said, I'm going to start going down to church on Saturday night and praying over all the chairs and pews and everything. And uh, so I was doing that. But I, I was sort of trying to pray in humility, you know. Uh, I want to be real humble in prayer. And, and uh, I was sort of asking God if He thought maybe perhaps if it might be all right, if it somehow could be in His will, that maybe He might bless the service tomorrow. And... Uh, and the Lord seemed to say to me, Son, stop begging. You're not a beggar coming to the back door. You're a son coming to the Father. He said, Ask me. And ask me with confidence. And ask me with boldness. And when you ask with boldness, you ask with confidence and you ask a lot more than you think you can get. I'm always reminded of Abraham praying and there's something about that that it always intrigues me when God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. You remember he came one day and he said, How can I do this thing and not tell Abraham? I've always felt that God tells intercessors things he doesn't tell anybody else. How can I do this and not tell Abraham my servant? He told Abraham his servant and Abraham began to pray. And you know what Abraham prayed? He said, Lord, you're the judge of all the earth. You're supposed to do what's right. And what you're about to do is not right. I mean, Lot and his family are there. Are you going to destroy the righteous with the wicked? And you call yourself a judge of all the earth and you're supposed to do what's right? Every time I read that, I sort of want to tug on Abraham's toga and say, you know who you're talking to, don't you? <laughs> I mean, there's enough fire and brimstone to go around. <laughs> but God listened. Abraham said if they're 50, all right. If they're 40, all right. If they're 30, all right. If they're 20, all right. If they're 10, all right. What do you think that's telling us of God? God is saying, ask. Ask. I can be dealt with. Ask. One of the things I want to find out one of these days, of course, when it gets to heaven, it won't matter, but is if Abraham had kept on going down to just one, if God would have spared the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. There's no indication that he wouldn't have. But that's bold, daring, praying. Same thing is true of uh, Moses when he went up to get the law. When he got back down, people broke and all of them before they ever had them. And Moses was pretty fed up with them and so was God. He said, leave me alone. Don't pray anymore for this people. I'm through with them. I've had them. I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to do anything with them. And Moses began to pray. And you know what he said? He said basically two things. He said, Lord, if you do what you're going to do, you're going to run your reputation. He said, if you kill these people, leave them out here to die, all the enemies will mock and say, ah, aha, he just took them out there in the desert to kill them. He said, people will mock. You'll ruin your reputation. Second thing is, you'll be breaking your word because you promised to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob that you'd make of these a great people. And if you back out, you're going to break your own word. Now there again, I, I uh, submit to you that's rather daring and bold praying. But then comes that strange verse that says, And God repented of the evil he intended to do. God relented. God changed his mind. You say, do you believe God did that? I, it's, it's what it says. Well, I thought God didn't change his mind. Well, that's true, but it says that he did.
God doesn't change his mind, but he did. See, what you and I have to keep in mind is that we read the Bible from man's point of view. God speaks to us in human language so we can understand it. And I believe that we understand that God, in a sense, never changes his mind. But when God is expressing himself to us, he uses language that we understand. I don't know what really happened, but in my terms, in my language, I'd call that change in mind. Now, whether God changed his mind or not is beside the point. God said it that way, that's the way he meant for me to take it. As far as, it, I mean, it looks to me like in man's terms, God changed his mind. All I know is that God is saying, this is what prayer can do. This is the effectiveness of intercession. God doesn't change his mind, but he did. Because Moses prayed. That is bold, daring intercession. Now there's another aspect of it that I think is very important, and it is this. That intercessory praying, and I don't really know how to say this, intercessory praying is position praying. That's not a good way to say it, but it's the only way I can say it right now. The essence of intercession, it seems to me, is in the word identification or substitution, but identification is better, I think. You'll notice that this man identified himself with the need of his traveler. He wasn't the one that was hungry, but yet he acted like he was hungry. And he went begging for bread as though he was the one that needed the bread. There was a sense in which he identified the man in need. And like my friend in that airport motel, he took upon himself my burden. He identified himself with the need of that man. And he went in that position to beg bread for him. There is a very real sense in which true intercession is not just petition, but it is a position that you and I achieve. It's a position that you and I gain, and we pray from that position. Isaiah says the Lord made intercession for the transgressors. He's not simply saying that, that Jesus prayed for them. He's saying that the Lord, when He came, His very life was an act of intercession. Everything Jesus did was an act of intercession. Not just when he prayed for them, but the very fact that he identified himself with man by coming in the flesh. And he was baptized by John in Jordan, which was a baptism of repentance. As though Jesus himself were a sinner, he was identifying himself with sinful man. Throughout the days of his life, Jesus identified himself with mankind. And from the position of being identified with us, he offered his life as an intercession. It is a, it is a, it is a identifying myself with the need of this person. It's a position from which we pray. I think one of the great, great illustrations of this would be found in 1 Peter chapter 3, where he's talking to a, an un, a Christian wife who has an unsaved husband. And he says, Likewise, you wives, if any... A husband obeys not the word, they may without the word be one. Now what he's saying is that there are some people who can be one to Christ without preaching to them. They can't be one to Christ without the word of God, but here he's talking about you don't have to drag them into church or you don't have to stand over at the breakfast table preaching to them all the time. If any of them will not hear the word, they can be one without a word. How? By beholding the pure behavior of the wife. You see, there are some people that cannot be won to Christ by conventional methods. They won't come to church. They won't listen to preaching. There are some people who can be won to Christ only by certain people. In this case, by the wife. How does the wife win this lost husband to the Lord? Uh, by her pure behavior. By the life that she lives. It's not the petition that she makes to the Lord that converts her husband. It is the position she lives in. She, in a sense, sanctifies herself for the salvation of her husband. And she says, I will live whatever kind of life it is that it takes to win my husband to Christ. I'll make certain that all of my behavior is chaste and pure and that my adorning is not of the outward ornaments, but it is of the inward beauty and godliness of the, of the heart. 
I will do whatever is necessary. I will take up whatever position is necessary to win my husband to Christ. Now that woman is interceding. Whether she prays or not, she is interceding. She says, I'm going to bake him his favorite pie. That pie is a prayer to God for his salvation. He comes home and treats her rough and she receives it in a Christian way. That is intercession. Everything she does, taking bad things and enjoying good things, everything she does is intercession. Why? Because she has achieved, she has gained a certain position. She says, I am going to sanctify myself for the salvation of my husband. And I'm going to live for the salvation of my husband. I think that this is true. I think that this is true. I think that while prayer does not always have to be agonizing and in the sense of pain and travail, there is a sense in which I do not believe you and I can ever be nonchalant and pray at the same time. There is an agony that you and I go through in, in, in intercession. It's an agony of the spirit, an agony of the soul. It is the feeling, it is the agony that drives me to pray because I feel what that person is feeling. And their pain is my pain. And their darkness is my darkness. I don't think you intercede for people nonchalantly and passionlessly. I have found that I pray for my children a lot of times. But then I find there are times when my heart becomes so burdened, I'm about to break and I can't help it. And I begin to pray. And somehow I bear their burdens in my heart and I begin to feel the pain that they feel. And I begin to weep as they weep. And uh, I'm praying as much for myself as I am for them. The Syrophoenician mother said, Lord, have mercy on me and heal my daughter. Well, what are you talking about? You ought to say, have mercy on my daughter and heal her. No, she said, have mercy on me and heal my daughter. Why? Because she was in terrible pain. To heal the daughter would to be show mercy to her. And I believe that when I somehow arrive at a position, when I say, Lord, God, I need mercy. My heart's breaking and I need mercy, Lord. And the only way that you can show me mercy is by answering my prayer and saving my son or, or healing this loved one. <coughs> intercession, true intercession is identification. It, it means that am I, am I really willing to, to take up that person's position? I think Paul was hinting at this when in Galatians he said, bear your own burdens. There are some burdens we have to bear ourselves, but he said, bear ye one another's burdens that you may live. A lot of burdens I have to bear by myself. I have no right ask anybody else to take responsibility for a lot of my things in my life. But I want to tell you something, folks. There's some burdens I just can't bear all by myself. I just cannot do it. And unless somebody comes along in prayer and intercession and says, Lord, I want to identify myself with that person. And Lord, I'll act as though I'm the one that's hungry. And I'll act as though as I'm the one that's in pain. And I'll pray as though answering his prayer would be answering my prayer. That's intercession. And that's what this fellow did. He went out and he begged for bread. There was a position that he gained. There was a, a commitment that he made. And, and when he got in that position, God was able to answer the prayer and bless him. There's one other thing in this before we move on. I mentioned a moment ago that word importunity. That's a very interesting word. Uh, there are different translations of it. Because of his importunity. The word literally means uh, shamelessness. It, it means uh, an inability to be embarrassed. It means someone who can't be put to shame. In other words, if, if I had been knocking at the door of that man's house that night and he had told me to go away, I'd have been embarrassed. I'd just been too embarrassed to keep on. I'd have been so humiliated I'd turned away. But this fella was born without a shame nerve. He, there's not anything in the world could make him embarrassed. He just keeps on banging and banging away. And Jesus says because of his inability to be embarrassed, which brings about his persistence, 
he will rise and give him as many as he needs. The other parable that Jesus gave is in Luke chapter 18 about the widow and the unjust judge. And it also emphasizes the same thing, persistence. This widow came to the judge and said, I want you to avenge my cause, but he wouldn't do it. Why? Because she was a widow. Anytime the Lord in the Bible wants to put a person, picture a person as the most helpless, pitiful thing in all the world, he always uses the widow. Because in, in that time there, were no, there was no social security and, and no charitable organizations and a widow whose husband had died and she had no means of support was the, most, was the weakest, most pitiful creature imaginable. So any time that Jesus wants to emphasize our weakness, He always pictures us as a widow. So He says, here, here are two ends of, of the spectrum. A judge, the most powerful man there is, and the widow the weakest person there is and this widow goes to the judge and says I want you to avenge my cause and give me justice but the judge says I don't fear God and I don't have any use for man and can't help me to avenge her case so he doesn't do it but the woman keeps coming back and keeps coming back and finally you know what the judge said the judge said though I fear not God and have no regard for man yet this woman, lest by her continual coming she weary me, I'm going to take her case. I don't like to keep on sounding like a dictionary, but I mean these words are important. The word weary there means literally to be black and blue. And what the judge was saying is, I'm going to go ahead and give this woman what she wants because I'm afraid that she's going to keep coming at me and beat me black and blue. I mean, she may come with a rolling pin next time. I don't know. And this is what Jesus said. Hear ye then the parable of the unjust judge. If that man who is so cruel and unkind, if he will be persuaded by the persistence of that woman, how much more will your heavenly Father? How much more will the Lord avenge his elect? And then Jesus makes this statement. When the Son of Man comes, will He find this kind of faith on the earth? What kind of faith? The kind of faith that is so stubbornly persistent, laying siege to the throne of God, just keeps on knocking and knocking and knocking and will not go away, will not take no for an answer. I love the story of Jacob, and I preach on Jacob a lot. The wrestling match, you remember? And man jumped on Jacob one night, and they began to wrestle. And then uh, suddenly Jacob realized he was wrestling with the Lord or with somebody who was mighty close to him. And uh, this angel, as Hosea calls him, an angel, he said, uh, he said, let me go, the day now breaks. And Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. I will not let you go until you bless me. Now folks, there's always been something to me sort of fishy about that story. Do you think that that angel could not have gotten loose from Jacob if he really wanted to. Do you think that Jacob was able to hold up that angel? I don't think so. I think that fight was fixed. <laughs> I think that angel was saying, let me go. But I hope he doesn't. He hangs on just a bit longer to get the blessing. Persistence. Persistence, it scares me to think that uh, I gave up too soon on some things. And I dread someday perhaps discovering that if I just held on a little bit longer, been a little bit more stubborn, I'd have gotten the blessing. Only God knows what changes could have happened. Only God knows what churches could have been saved and what, what communities could have had revival if you and I had not grown weary in well-doing. Somebody says, well, how... How long should I pray? And Well, I always believe in praying until the burden's gone. I believe God puts a burden on our heart not to mock us and not to burden us, but simply that He may lift that burden. And if I have a burden on my heart for a need or a person, I, I believe I'm to persist in that praying for that person until suddenly the burden is lifted, until the burden is gone. So intercessory praying is daring and bold and audacious. It also has in it the quality of identification where you take upon yourself the needs of that other person. And lastly, 
Intercessory praying is what I would like to call desperate praying. Desperate praying. That there is a sense of urgency about it. There is a sense of urgency about it. And I'd like to just share with you three things that I think ought to make our praying desperate. I want to read again beginning with verse 5, these few verses. And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves? For a friend of mine in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. First of all, Jesus is saying, we need to be desperate in our praying because we have a responsibility that we cannot escape. He says, a friend of mine has come to me. A friend in his journey has come to me. He didn't say he's come to my neighbor. He hasn't come to the preacher. He's come to me. There is an inescapable responsibility that I have. Because once this man knocks at my door, suddenly I have a responsibility that I cannot escape. I think you and I ought to see the same thing in our own lives. I do have an inescapable responsibility. When I was pastor, I went to see a woman in the hospital one day. And uh, she was a member of the church, but uh, she didn't come much. About the only time I saw her was when she'd go to the hospital and need a visit. And I was visiting with her one day. And I'll be honest with you, I wasn't too happy about it because... Uh, she never would come to church. She'd make all kinds of statements while she was in the hospital, but pledges and promises, but she never would come to church until she got sick again, and she'd call me. I was standing there visiting with her one day, talking with her, and she began to talk about her son, her 17-year-old son. And she began to blame the church for the problems she was having with him. Blame the youth director. Blame the youth choir. I stood there and listened to her. Blame uh, the church. Blame me. Blame the deacons. Blame the youth. Said that church just doesn't have a good enough youth program. Said my son wouldn't be on the street right now doing drugs if that church had a decent youth program. And we need a youth, new youth minister. And you'll have to remember this is just it was in the days when I was carnal. I, this is before I got spiritual. I said, ma'am, we may need a new youth director. And our youth minister may not be what it ought to be. And our deacons probably not what they ought to be. I'm not what I ought to be. But I want to tell you something. Your boy is your own responsibility. God nowhere in the Bible ever said that I as a church or a youth director was to take on the responsibility of raising your children. You are there. There are your responsibility. Nobody else's. They're yours. But we do. We, we like to... We as well, if my child is going wrong, something wrong with the youth director, something wrong with the program of that church. Well, I'm not going to deny that sometimes there are things wrong with our church. There are a lot of things wrong with them. But I do know this. I have an inescapable responsibility, and it's my children. I can't, I can't push it off on anybody else. And that ought to make me pray. That ought to make me pray. My wife loves babies, and, and uh, she was, I was looking at one the other night. And uh, I said, oh, I said, my wife saw that. She'd try to take it away from you. She loves babies. She just loves them. Well, everywhere we are, she, she sees those babies. She goes to the nursery and looks at those babies. And I get to thinking maybe she's talk, thinking about adopting one or something. <laughs> you know what I tell her? I say, honey, that thing will be 13 one of these days. <laughs> Snaps her right out of it, boy. I mean... <laughs> Snaps her right out of it. <laughs> Folks, I didn't learn how to really intercede until my children became teenagers. That's when I got serious about it. I was preaching in Bowleggs, Oklahoma, First Baptist Church of Bowleggs, Oklahoma. I was 19 years old back in 1956. I'd heard an evangelist preach a sermon on the home. I thought it was a great sermon. I preached it that night. Here I am, 19-year-old college student, house full of people, preaching on husband and wives and how to raise children. <laughs> After the service, a fella came up to me. He is a visiting pastor. He said, that was a good sermon. I said, thank you. Uh, how many children do you have? I said, well, I, I don't have any. I'm not married. He said, I have nine. He said, son... When you have children, you'll throw that sermon away. <laughs> that was 1956. 
In 1986, 30 years later, I was in the First Baptist Church of Chickasha, Oklahoma. I preached one night. A fellow walked up. I recognized him immediately. hadn't seen him in 30 years. He came up to me. The first thing he said was, Well, did you throw that sermon away? I said, Yes, sir, I did. But I want to be honest with you people. I don't guess I really understood what it meant to agonize in prayer until I had an inescapable responsibility of some kids. And I began to see that nothing else in the world was working. And you can do all the methods you want to and go to all the seminars you want to, but sooner or later those kids have to make a choice of their own. And you can, you can do everything right and still things get kind of nervous. Somebody has come to me in their journey. Somebody has come to me. They are my inescapable responsibility. And I'll tell you, somebody has come to you. Maybe the fellow that works next to you. Maybe the person that's sex next to you in class. And you may be the only contact they have with the gospel. We need to be aware that there are some folks that have come to us and they are our inescapable responsibility. The second thing that ought to make us urgent and desperate in our praying is this. He says, and I have nothing to set before him. Insufficient resources. Inescapable responsibility, inadequate resources. I have nothing to set before him. That says it better than any other way can be said. I was praying in my office one Sunday morning. We had a black evangelist that had come from Khartoum, Sudan in the service. He was praying with me in the office. I'll never forget what he prayed. He said, Father, if you don't bless the pastor today, the people will go away hungry. If you don't bless the pastor, the people will go away hungry. I've never forgotten that because it made me realize my inadequate responsibility. I mean, when I get up there and preach, those people are not going to be blessed unless God blesses me. And the blessing that overflow my life, that's what blesses my own people's lives and grows the church. I have nothing to set before them. Man, what a difference it would make if every time we walked into the choir or the pulpit or the Sunday school room, we said in our hearts, Lord, I have nothing to set before them. If anything is going to be set before them, it has to be the Lord. It has to be the Lord. Then the third thing is this. We ought to be desperate and urgent in our praying because of His inevitable reward. Over in verse 8, Jesus says, I say unto you, though He will not rise and give Him because He is His friend... Yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. Now, he asked for three loaves. By the way, Barclay tells us that one loaf was a day's supply. It's always interested me that this fellow, I guess he thought, well, since I'm going out begging bread, I'll just get a bunch. And uh, so he asked for three loaves. I mean, if you're going to lose a friend, lose it for something big. <laughs> Beg for three loaves, three days' supply. The Bible says that the man got up and gave him as many as he needed. Did he get the three loaves? I don't know. But I know he got as many as he needed. Doesn't say he got three loaves, just said he gave him as many as he needs. God's inevitable reward. I walk in with my, I have nothing to set before him, and I walk out with his much more. There's only one place, folks, to get bread, and that's from the Father. Only one way to get it, by asking for it. People are always asking me, why do you think so many people are going off into all these false teachings and false churches and erroneous doctrine? I say, I think one of the main reasons is this, that if a man gets hungry enough, he'll eat bread out of a garbage can. I've seen people do that. And I believe that many of our churches have become nothing but big, empty bread boxes. And they come to our door seeking bread, and they don't find any, and they go away hungry. I guarantee you, friend, the devil is always waiting outside the door with garbage can bread to feed those people. That's the reason. That's the reason. 
You see, you don't go away from a place if there's bread there. The only reason you walk away and look for something else is because you're not getting the bread. God's inevitable reward. He give him as much as he needs. All right, let's pray together.